Welcome to News Click. Amidst all the pomp and show of the 71st Republic Day Parade, where Indian military displayed its firepower and its arsenal, what stuck out, or rather what, what disturbed one, was the fact that more than 70% of the weapons on display were of foreign make. So 71 years since we became a republic, we are still grappling with a major issue that we might appear to be a leading or a major military power, but actually uh, it may not be uh, a true depiction of the reality because our dependence on foreign manufacturers, our dependence on foreign technology, our dependence on foreign capital makes our position as a leading power, uh, or something of a suspect. But there are many issues related to it. And once again, as we come close to the annual budget, it's time for us to take a quick look at some of the major developments that have taken place. We have with us D. Raghunandan, member of Delhi Science Forum and a defense analyst, to take us once again through the uh, zigzags of, of uh, our military acquisition procurement policies. Welcome to News Click, uh, Raghu. Let me start. Uh, it struck me as rather, once again, you know, that most of the weapons that we were being shown on the Republic Day were of foreign make. Now, that itself should not be of surprise, except we have in the last six years been trying for what is called make in India policy and thought that in the last six years, maybe there have been some developments, something to show that we are gradually moving away from our dependence on foreign technology. Raghu, just as an overall uh, impression of yours, uh, what do you think? I mean, how do you react to this? See, the, we've gone through several years of modification, a decade or more, of the defense procurement policy. And recently, uh, a new category has been introduced, which is of indigenous design development and made yes. manufacture, uh, which is supposed to be given top priority. Hmm. That is, once you identify a piece of equipment, then if you go down the priority list, indigenous uh, designed and manufactured weapons should come first. And then you go lower down transfer of technology, license production, outright import, uh, etc. However, in practice, uh, on I think on the political side, there is a very clear preference for dealing with foreign OEMs, with partnerships of foreign OEMs with domestic private sector manufacturers coming next in priority. Unfortunately, uh, a fairly substantial section of the armed forces also goes along with this. And as you know, this section of the armed forces has never had faith in indigenously made equipment. Uh, they think it takes too long for indigenous development to take place and that in any case it will end up being inferior to what you can buy from the West. Uh, so that strand is also continuing to function. However, I am increasingly seeing some straws in the wind uh, where it looks as if some sections of the uh, military and some sections of this wider strategic community uh, are beginning to realize the perils of over-dependence on foreign uh, OEMs, particularly because, as I'm sure we will discuss, domestic manufacture in collaboration between Indian private sector and foreign OEMs is also a path which is totally dependent on the Correct. foreign OEMs. Yeah. What I find surprising and, and, and a welcome shift is precisely in the kind of language that we are hearing for the first time, after hearing how HAL, the public sector, Hindustan Aeronautics Limited, or the ordinance factories were uh, damned 
uh, maligned, I thought, uh, run down for all kind of reasons, uh, where they question their capability and etc. We seem to be hearing from now the new lot of uh, armed forces commanders a different language. For instance, the Indian Air Force chief came out and said that he believed in indigenous. Mm -hmm. And uh, now the Air Force, for instance, for the advanced multi-role combat aircraft, uh, they have said that they are going to add a clause which insists that the engine which is put on the AMCA would be of local origin. So the first two squadrons will use an advanced version of GE 414 engine of American yeah. made. And Hopefully. the rest of them would be local manufacturers. But the surprising thing is that this, the senior officers of Indian Air Force believe that there are some European companies or countries which would be willing to share Indian technology. So, uh, Raghu, my first question to you is, how realistic is this? I mean, I welcome this move for insisting on indigenous local manufactured engine, but how realistic is yeah, this? Yeah, there's two aspects to this. One is uh, dealing with volumes. Yeah. If you are going to manufacture engines, it can only be done if there is a substantial number uh, of aircraft that you also manufacture. Mm -hmm. uh, if you take the 36 Rafales that India has ordered, not only does it not make economical sense to manufacture the aircraft, it makes even less economical sense to manufacture engines yes. uh, in such small numbers. So that's one aspect that needs to be taken into account. The second aspect is if you get collaborators from foreign engine manufacturers, who are prepared to collaborate with you in manufacture. India has been doing that for years. Mm -hmm. In HAL, we have been manufacturing British-made Orpheus engines. Yes. We have you been have manufacturing yes. uh, helicopter engines from Turbomeca and Snecma mm -hmm. uh, and so on. We could continue doing that. Mm -hmm. The point really is for India to be able to develop its own design development capability for aircraft engines. That's a steep mountain to climb. Mm -hmm. uh, and it would be welcome if there is a foreign consultant or manufacturers who are prepared to help you develop that capability uh, through hand-holding, during from the design process on till manufacture. Mm -hmm. I would not, I, I would hold my breath. Yeah, why would they do uh, it? Why would they do it, precisely. And engine technology, uh, as I've discussed with you before, is the most difficult aspect of aeronautics. Uh, even China, which has uh, advanced rapidly in terms of uh, airframe air development mm. in uh, fighter aircraft as well as in civilian passenger uh, aircraft, is still struggling to develop engines. Uh, which just goes to show that uh, it's a tough uh, ask and it will require persistence and considerable funding. And unfortunately, the government of India has still now not shown its uh, stamina and courage to deal with long gestation mm. research and development projects, which necessarily will be costly but which will show its returns over yes. several decades. Uh, but it remains to be seen if that can happen. It's welcome that the Air Force has expressed its preference, but if we look at the near to medium term, it is likely to lead to collaboration in manufacture, uh, whether it will lead to collaboration in design development capability remains to be seen. In fact, it's interesting. The recently uh, ne uh, negotiations took place between India and Russia for uh, purchase of 200 Kamov helicopters. So price negotiations took place for variety of items that would go into making of it. One of the interesting features of the Kamov uh, helicopter, uh, Raghu, you know perfectly well, is that it uses Safran That's engine. Right. It's a That's French right. Safran engine. That's right. Now, um, which in fact goes to prove the point that you're making. 
But what is equally interesting is that a consultant uh, appointed by uh, Ministry of Defense recently came out uh, with a statement saying that India should not be purchasing any foreign helicopters because, and particularly with reference to Navy, oh, because he said get the Dhruv helicopter, advanced Dhruv helicopter, light helicopter that uh, HAL has manufactured is quite capable Absolutely. of being used for naval uh, for naval purposes. And instead of buying something foreign, we Complete. have something domestic, and that should be used. Absolutely. I mean, on this, there, I have written about this uh, right. extensively uh, earlier as well. Uh, you have an existing platform mm. based on which you can design the, uh, or in fact just adapt mm. the naval uh, utility yeah. uh, helicopters uh, to make them ship uh, born. Particularly, you need to have a foldable mm. rotors. Uh, because you can imagine in a small constricted space of a ship, if you have helicopters with rotors yes, exactly. extending becomes difficult. So you have foldable uh, rotors and also a foldable tail uh, so that they occupy less space. And HAL is confident that it can develop this from its Dhruv uh, ALH in a matter of two to three years, mm. which even if you contract with a foreign OEM, they are going to take three years to start delivering uh, in any case. Uh, but I'll add, going back to the Rafale example I was citing, part of the offsets deal there is an investment by uh, Safran of about 7,000 crores in assisting with the final stage of development of the indigenous Kaveri engine, which is intended for the AMC, uh, for the advanced. Uh, okay. yeah. So it remains to be seen how far that gets implemented, whether it goes the distance that India wants. Because if India plays its cards well, works out a proper deal with Safran, then that could form a platform for future development of other aero engines, because if you develop one engine, it gives you the capability of developing a family of engines around that mm. uh, design. So 7,000 crores is not a very large amount, but it's not too small an amount either. And something can be done depending on the base from which you are starting. Uh, it's interesting what you said initially in your opening um, uh, comments that you made. You drew attention to the fact that strategic partnership where a domestic private manufacturer ties up with a foreign OEM and manufactures goods in India is something seems to be the path that the government is still relying on, yeah. pushing. Yeah. That seems to be happening now, it seems, with the rupees 45 crores submarine, um, stealth submarine uh, uh, production. Uh, yes. Where they have shortlisted two companies. Yeah. One is Mazagon Docks Limited. Yeah. And the other is L&T. Right. Now, the interesting thing there, uh, Raghu, we talked about it last time also in a program, was that Adani Defense had suddenly entered the scene and complicated the matters. And there yeah. was confusion as to how they could enter the picture. That's anyway, right. the, mercifully, the Ministry of Defense has, has sorted that out and have narrowed it down to Mazagon Docks yeah. Limited and l &D. Yeah. Now, what is your uh, assessment? Do you think Mazagon Docks Limited, which is a public sector unit, would they be preferred over l &D? Or would the government of India, you think, in the name of pushing its Make in India program and strategic partnership? There are two aspects to this. Uh, first is that um, while l &T is yet to develop or yet to demonstrate its capability of complete submarine uh, uh, manufacture, systems integration, etc. LNT has considerable expertise in the submarine area and has played a big role in the manufacture of India's indigenous Arihant uh, nuclear powered uh, submarine. Secondly, Mazagon Docks has got all the capability, hmm. but uh, there are doubts about whether it is not overloaded with uh, prior orders. Uh, Personally, if you ask me, there are several areas of defense equipment manufacture in this country which, uh, in which the private sector can play a role, either in manufacture of large components, large uh, sub-assemblies, 
or even full scale uh, equipment manufacture precisely because HAL is got its orders books fairly full at least now mm -hmm. uh, and is relatively up to uh, you mean provided capacity it gets the LCA orders provided it now. gets the LCA orders and provided the naval helicopters in fact the naval helicopters would come in very handy because HAL is already setting up the come off uh, mm. factory, a separate uh, facility for that and it would not be too difficult to add the manufacturing assembly lines for the uh, naval helicopter uh, to that. But there are capacity constraints in the public sector. So I would not uh, dismiss the idea of involving the private sector to expand capacity provided they have the capability. Mm. And that is where I think there are in the Indian private sector very, very few manufacturers who one can rely on to manufacture whole systems, uh, be it land-based or ship-based. Uh, so it remains to be seen whether that feasibility is there. I would like to add, however, that till now, the major docks uh, in India, the shipbuilding yards, which are incidentally managed by naval officers, mm have shown extraordinary ability to be able to design and manufacture our own vessels. Mm. So even if we undertake this in collaboration with a foreign manufacturer, uh, it would only help in further augmenting this capability. Okay. Do you get a feeling, I mean, as the last question I'd like to pose to you is, given this back and forth that has been happening, do you get a feeling that we, there seems to be a realization that uh, somehow we have to get back to focusing on indigenization. Do you get a feeling that we are headed that way? I'm not too sure. Okay. And the reason why I say that is uh, there is a mistaken assumption hmm. that domestic manufacture hmm. is equivalent to domestic technological capability. Okay. We have been doing domestic manufacture under license for the past 50 to 60 years. But developing indigenous design and development capability is another cup of tea altogether. So I would go along with the suggestion that you are making, provided I see the commitment to developing design development capability. And that will involve substantial, dedicated, long-term commitment on the part of the government to defense R&D funding. And that has still now not been forthcoming. If you look at even the LCA uh, project, while much has been said about the delays, etc., by a DRDO, the fact also remains that they have been doing this on a shoestring budget. And if you, money comes in driblets uh, to you, that's no way to uh, design expensive and high-tech military hardware. So I would reach a conclusion of the kind that you are suggesting only when I see commitment to defense R&D uh, funding on the part of the government. But it also involves that you create capabilities so that you own and control Th the that's, technology. That's precisely what I'm. That's yeah. precisely why I'm emphasizing the defense R&D expenditure, okay, okay. because if you enter into license manufacture, which goes under the name of technology transfer, which it is not, mm -hmm. there is really no technology transfer. They will always sell you uh, the important hardware which they don't want to part with the technology mm -hmm. and then you can assemble the rest of it and make uh, secondary uh, uh, hardware for that. The real test is whether you are able to get the technological capability. I have always believed this is not something you will get through foreign collaboration because why should the collaborator pass on technology to you and cut his own uh, feet because tomorrow you, they are stopping you from ordering from him. Uh, so this is something you have to do on your own as we have shown in nuclear or in space. Uh, no collaboration you had uh, provided you with that uh, know-how. This is something you had to learn the hard way and we'll have to do the same here. Thank you Raghu. Thank you for this time.